Welcome, aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. We're here to engage in difficult conversations to make good trouble, as the late John Lewis would have put it. And we have the wonderful honor and pleasure of having with us Professor Benita Randall, Professor Emerita of the University of Dayton School of Law, and maybe the leading blog and scholar person in the country on race, racism, and the law at racism.org. Commend that website to you and that site to you. And Tina Patterson, mediator, arbitrator, consultant, and actually a master of what might be called more generally conflict coaching for people who want to prevent it, manage it, and resolve it. Tina, Renelia, thanks so much for joining us, or Professor Rendell. Um, so Thank today's you. topic is women in leadership. So hard to find a place to start with that one, but why not start with the obvious? Would you agree that men have achieved what the military called FUBAR? I men in leadership. FUBAR is. Blanked up beyond all recognition. I am drawing a blank. Blanked up beyond all. Re oh, okay, I got it. <laughs> okay. It took me a second to, for my mind to process it, but I finally got it. Uh, yeah, I would say that white men in the society can be mediocre, very mediocre, and be very successful. Uh, and uh, I don't think women, I mean, I'm not saying that women don't have some fucked up value systems, some of us uh, in leadership roles, especially when we, I mean, I think the problem becomes that I'm I'm really I was thinking about this when you told me this. I'm really interested in women outside of power structure leaderships because my view is anyone within a power structure, and this included myself, conforms to that structure. Okay. That that and and the higher up in leadership they get in the in the structure the more they have a conformed. And in order to make that conformity, I believe that they have had to sacrifice, and this is men too, have a, uh, sacrificed the interests of the communities they come from at some level, some more than others, but you don't, you don't, I mean, I mean, it's a, what's a cognitive dissonance. They, if they want to move up, they have to adopt the value of the system. The system is one about maintaining white supremacy. Uh, they, even though they might not admit that to themselves, as they move up, they have to begin to justify the things that are detrimental that is happening to the community. And that's only. If you fight the system, you may stay, you may get into the system. You can fight the system, but you're never going to get a high leadership role and maintain it if you do that kind of behavior. Uh, so I'm always interested in people who are outside the disrupt system, who are being disruptive from the outside. Uh, don't ask me to name anyone because I can't drop names. What's her name, uh, Ms. Patterson? What's her? What's the name of the woman who was my parents' age from the South, who's sick and tired of being sick and tired and disrupting? Fanny Lou Hamer. Fanny Lou Hamer. She There's was a one. disruptor. She was not in the system. She was a disruptor of the system. So, Professor Randall, Tina, you have been and exemplified 
leading professional women in various areas and activities and situations and circumstances at various times with varying degrees of receptivity and resistance. Um, Tina, for you, where has most of the resistance that is still problematic come from in your experience to women in leadership? That's an interesting question. I, I think Professor to Professor Randall's point, I operate in a space that is primarily male dominated, primarily white male dominated. And for a long time, the the structure of the leadership was significantly older than me. So there was sometimes um, a bit of patronizing, uh, you know, you remind me of my daughter, and but I'm not your daughter. Um, me leading a group and having a colleague say, you sound like my ex-wife. Well, I'm one, I'm not your wife, nor am I your estranged wife, but those types of comments. And, and what I find, the, the, and this is a fine line between being an ally and an advocate, the men that were on the call when the gentleman said I sounded like his ex-wife because I was asking him for the status on a deliverable, no one said anything. But as soon as the call ended, people were calling and emailing. And I was like, you know, the time for you to have said something was in the room to actually say, hey, man, you know, let's get back to the topic. She asked you for a status on this deliverable. So it's, it's that type of conversation or the, the conversations that you wouldn't ask a, a, another male colleague, um, you know, and, and literally having to either, and I think you're right, Professor Randall, either you learn to navigate it or you live a life on what I call a tightrope. You know, mm -hmm. so in the roles that I've had, especially as an appointed official, there was a significant difference for me between my life in the public versus my private life. And that was by choice. I felt like once I stepped into my abode, that that was my life. And when I was with family and friends, that they shouldn't be subjected to what was going on with, with the public. But the public doesn't see it that way. And so I could be stopped at dinner. I could be stopped while I'm out having a meal with friends or someone coming up to me at, a, at an event. Th those are some of the things I think as a, as a, a woman leader in particular, that we navigate and we sometimes navigate it without really someone pulling us to the side and saying, hey, you know what? You need to have a, a circle of friends or you need to have a support system that's going to back you up and say, you know, when you go to an event, make sure that you let us know where you're going so that we can look out for you. Or if you have to travel and you're concerned about your safety, let, we can let someone know. So there, you know, Again, being in this male-dominated space, I'm functioning, but there's also aspects I have to take into account that I'm not a male. And so when I'm in a space where I sense that I may be unsafe, I take additional safeguards. Where I'm in a space where I'm one of only a handful of women in the room, I'm taking note of, of how the room is laid out. Let's, not take in, let's also take into account both Professor Randall and I are women of color. And that verifies the space even more. I've mm -hmm. been an arbitrator now for 23 years, and I can't tell you about an arbitration where I have been on a panel where it's been all women of color. Nothing against my colleagues, but it definitely changes the tenor of the conversation when I am either a the one of the wings or I'm the chair and how, how the room reacts to me. So I'm hoping I'm answering your question, but it's 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 definitely, there's something to be said. And I think there is sometimes a, there is a, 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 a tension. There's a, a psychic tension, there's a mental tension, there's an emotional tension. Um, I, I'll share this story. Years ago, I worked for a, division that was part of American Airlines. And I was going to headquarters, which at that time was near Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And there was a woman who was on the the shuttle with us and she started to tell a joke. And she started to tell a joke that she thought was funny. And the other people on the shuttle saw me sitting in the back. I was sitting behind her. And it was a very negative joke about African-Americans. And she started to chastise them. Well, what's fun, What's wrong with you? Why aren't you laughing? 
and no one would answer her. And then I went to get off the shuttle. She didn't think anything of it, but I have to wonder, you know, we, we constantly draw this line of, well, women always support women. We don't. We don't always support each other. And that's another factor. So I know your focus has been on, on the, the male, female, the tension, but it sometimes is within the, the, whip, the scope of women. I mean, that's one example. The, 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 there's another we can talk about regarding the queen bee syndrome, but I'll stop there. No, and that's a fantastic response because, I mean, you've opened about 63 different doors to perspectives on the questions of not only women in leadership, how women are viewed, how women are treated, what biases other people bring in the room, where the support points and possible allies are, where the resistance and the rest of that stuff are. I'll tell you honestly, if I go into a room and I'm as stale male and pale as anybody, if I go into a room of other older white oriented males, I'm not comfortable with that. Ah, if I have a choice, I'm not gonna go there. That's not where I think intelligent, balanced, comprehending, respectful, humane, responsible, understanding and decision-making or action will take place. It's just not been my experience. I'm only 78, so it could happen within the <laughs> next few years, but, at least in the first 78 years, the track record of my SMP compatriots is not that good. So and how do we move the needle? Well, I'm going to take a stab at this because, and, and and then I'll, I'll I'll be quiet, Professor Randall. No, go right it's, ahead. This ally versus advocate conversation, and you know, we hear a lot about we people want allies. I want an advocate. I want an advocate that when I'm not in the room and you hear someone talking about me and they've made an assumption regarding my education, my background, my experience, or my ability, that that advocate speak up. I, I shared with a colleague recently, she was telling me, oh, I sat next to this woman in the room, she was all by herself. Trust me when I say this, most women and women of color that are in these spaces of leadership, they know what it means to walk alone. They've sat and had lunch by themselves. They've had dinner by themselves. They've sat at happy hour by themselves. They've gone into a room where people have asked them, can you tell me where the bathroom is? Because they think that they're the staff. What we want and what we need are advocates. And it's not just the men, it's the women that are that sometimes are, are not speaking up and saying, hey, you know what? Professor Randall is a worthwhile um professor she's a subject matter expert she should be engaged in this conversation and not just sit silently while i was waiting don't wait speak up that's the advocacy that we're talking about and that's the advocacy that's needed that the days of allyship i think are i'll just say i think they're numbered because people have, have said you know what i'm an ally you're an ally until you're not an ally I think you're exactly right. I think the whole advocate, I I look back at my uh, 30 years at the University of Dayton and what most important to me was the people on the faculty who were advocates and they were few. They had <laughs> one or two uh, or in, a, in terms of 25, 30 people on the faculty and one or two I could count as true advocates. And I think that's an important distinction. People who I knew, and not just me as a person, defend me as a person, defend my programs. That, that uh, I ran the academic support program and when the program got, was going to get attacked, if you're an advocate, you're going to speak up for it. If you have problems that with the program that you need to figure out with me, you figure that out with me. You come to me and you say, you know, I want to really be an advocate for you, but I don't know how to defend you when they say so and so and so and so. What about the program? What is it that I should know about the program so that I can be a better advocate? 
instead of sitting silently when the attacks on the programs happen and then saying, well, I didn't know what to say. Well, of course you didn't know what to say. You didn't ask. You didn't come to me. You didn't. And when I tried to, you know, there's only so much part of the problem. And this is part of the problem of being the only person of color on the faculty is, is that you get drained just trying to cover stuff and think of what do I need to do? Who do I need to talk to? Where do I need to go? Where I'm going to get this advocacy? You know, how am I going to get this information out? And especially like for my life, because I've always pushed race and racism in the law uh, as an explicit thing that needs to be taught in law schools. And I was attacked royally. Petitions, people did, <laughs> classes did petition uh, to the deans. Every year there would be problems. And there the, the response of the faculty was, well, she has academic freedom. And I've always said, that's a shitty response. That is such a shitty response. Because to me, what it sounds like, you're saying to the students, you know, we don't like what she do any better than you. But she has academic freedom. So it ain't much we can do about it. And maybe they thought they were calling themselves being an ally by not shutting down what I was doing because I was really ahead of my time back there in the 90s, uh, what I was doing. I was doing so much different in my class. I was teaching small groups. I was, um, I was just doing a lot of things that were different. And maybe they thought that that was, they were being an ally by just saying that they have academic freedom. But then that, the message, the students was mumble and grumble and say, oh, they, they can't do anything about her because she has academic freedom. What would have an ally said? An ally would have said, Professor Randall is doing exactly what we think she needs to do. We support how she's teaching in her class. We support the activities that she's engaged in. And we understand that you're upset and don't like it, but you know, we think it needs to be done too. The academic freedom thing wouldn't even come in. They would support my activities. They wouldn't default to we can't do anything because she has academic freedom. And two, I think too often that's what allies do is they, they glamour from a rule that they can look at and say, oh, you know what? This person is functioning within the rules. This person is functioning within the regulations. This person is functioning within whatever framework we uh, that we have applied. And so your complaints, we're not going to hear them. From I suppose from their point of mind, that's a legitimate response. But a better response would be, we support what she's doing because she's a bright, intelligent, gifted teacher. Well, that's what I say about myself. <laughs> And we support what she's doing. Yeah, no, that's, no disagreement from Tana and me. <laughs> that's the difference between a ally and a advocate in terms of how they respond. And I had plenty of allies, plenty of allies who would say she has academic freedom, but I only had one or two uh, advocates who would say she's doing exactly what needs to be done and she's doing it in a way that needs to be done. You mean besides Tina and me, right? You've got one or two more. Absolutely. I got, <laughs> now that I'm, a, yes. 
<laughs> and, and actually, thanks to ThinkTech, you know, we now have Ben and David and, you know, <laughs> some others that may have started as allies, but now I, th I think fair to say we're advocates for each other. Absolutely. If anybody, and I think one of the things that's it's worth taking a, a second to say here is that there's a human perspective, not just a gender perspective, that is at the root of what I think I'm hearing from both of you, which is we stand up for ourselves, we stand up for each other, we stand up together. We are not Sisyphus rolling the damn rock up the hill, knowing we'll never get to the top. Hey, we are Tina and Professor Randall and Ben and David and Sandra and Louise and the rest of us. And we're gonna get that damn rock up there. And anybody who happens to get in our way, hey, can either step aside and clap for the effort we're putting into it or, or deride or criticize or whatever they wanna do, but we're gonna move that rock up there with them or without them. Is what we're talking about here making choices, not only in our human relationships, but in the way that we honor them with and for each other. Is that the difference between an ally and an advocate? I'm not sure what, I mean. What moves the needle to get people from passive allies to active advocates? I don't know. Gina? You would have to ask people who move from ally to advocate. I can tell you what their behavior is and how I experience the difference. But I can't tell you that to me, because of that that is that is something you have to ask of people who were allies who moved to advocates. I can't I don't know let me yeah. offer one thing okay <clears throat> having been an ally in many situations maybe most and having been an advocate in some and increasingly more as I get older because I don't really give a shit about the people who don't maybe like that's what moves the people <laughs> Yeah, but I think what does it for some of us, certainly for me, is I look at Tina Patterson, I look at Professor Vernelia Randall, I look at Sandra Sims, I look at Louise Ng, I want to be in that room with that person. I am making the choice to not just be an ally, but to be aligned with that person. And to take the responsibility that comes with that alignment, not allyship, but alignment. What moves you to that path? What moved you to that point? Thinking about, this, this is a question I have for you. Thinking about someone who you only considered, who you only considered you was an ally to, and someone you knew long enough to do that, but at some point you started being an advocate. What changed to cause you to make that change? What happened, not change, what happened to cause you to make that change in yourself? Because I think that's a, that's a change of the person. That I don't, I, that, that's nothing that I can do. So what changed about you and the relationship even that cause you to make that change? That's a fantastic question. I mean, we could spend hours and hours and days on that, but two things, just straight, not from the top of my head, but from someplace a little deeper. One is each of those people, you, Tina, Sandra, Louise, Ben, others, you let me see who you are, who you choose to be, what matters to you, the meaning and value of that to me and my life is something that deserves to be honored, to be respected, to be understood, to be served, to be put first. 
So you have offered me the choice to not only see the value in you, but to connect with the value in you. I am simply taking that opportunity that you have made available out of generosity, out of kindness, out of courage. You don't have to do that. I'm not a person that provides any benefit or advantage to you of being your advocate rather than just your ally. But you've offered that because you have allowed me to see who you are and why I believe in that, why I trust that, and why I trust and believe in you. So that's the difference. So are you saying that is intrinsic, interest, interest, I can't even say the word. Intrinsic. Yeah, intrinsic is goes to our behavior. That is, I have to behave a certain way in order to get someone to be an ally. Great question. That, I mean, an advocate instead of an ally. I would word it. I, I, I'm happy that I behave in a way. I, I, I don't want to discount the the honor of being, uh, for, for you to come from ally to advocate, but it sounded like to me that you were saying that it was because of my behavior. And maybe that's true. I mean, you know, that, that, if we want, to, in order for someone to become an advocate, we have to look at our behavior. I saw a slightly different, twist on that and okay. I think and, and I'll be very quick about this it's the idea of I'm aware of my privilege not me saying this for the advocate I'm aware of my privilege I'm aware of my entitlement and I'm willing to exercise my privilege and my entitlement without regard to what you or the other person or the other person thinks on behalf of this person that 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 is not to be confused with a, a, a sponsor who is sometimes is using their social capital, but they may do it in a way that's much more guarded. When I with the advocates that I've experienced, it has literally been that I got this access. I can get you into this space. Let me write this letter of recommendation for you, or I'm happy to make this introduction, and I will vouch for you. I don't know if it's necessarily a a, a core there's a correlation with my behavior that makes it so, but more the person says, you know what? I'm willing, I'm willing to bet on you. I'm willing to stand by you, not just in the room where everybody can see it, you know, virtue signaling, but I'm willing to do it in the room when you're not there. And the person is, you know, saying, oh, well, you know what? We don't want Professor Randall to lead that group. Well, why not? You know, and using my resources to make that happen. I'll, I'll, I'll stop. I, I no, I think that's excellent, and 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 it's an excellent. And I is something I can wrap my brain around, because I, if I think over my life and not just on my faculty, I've had a half a dozen advocates who put themselves by. I was, I am and was a very flawed individual and uh, in, in different ways, at different times with different needs. And I've had people who had no reason to, they were allies, who decided to become advocate for me and reached out and just took me and sort of advocated for me in a, in a way that didn't that you know wasn't anything that they weren't going they weren't going to get anything from it. exactly you yeah. know uh, but they nevertheless advocated in the particular situation for me. And I want to answer your question, Vernita, because. Okay. <clears throat> The behavior, I mean, you could describe that. You could say it's a symptom. You could say it's a flag. You could say it's whatever it is. It's an indicator. But it, it's you have let me see where that comes from in you. That's why I make the choice. Okay. I can see that. 
And it's so, a choice. At the root of the choice, you have- It's a conscious choice. It's a conscious choice because you have offered the opportunity to earn your trust. And I see more than enough meaning and value in that to take the risk of attempting to earn your trust, recognizing that I may fall way short of earning your trust. But because the opportunity, the door is open, as Leonard Cohen put it, there's some light getting in through that crack. I'm gonna go toward the crack where the light is. Last thoughts, Tina? This has been an interesting conversation. I'm glad we got a chance to, to talk about advocacy. I, I really like the question that Professor Randall put forward because uh, we hear a lot of, I'm, I'm an ally I, and allyship. And when I start talking about being an advocate, people get really quiet because of the stakes involved. And, and literally, I guess dissecting this even further has been helpful, has been useful for those who see this video later and they're literally trying to explore what is it that I need? How how do I advance? Can I advance? And, and how do I navigate living in sometimes a, a bifurcated world? It's possible. But that advocate having that advocate is is definitely something whether it's one person or multiple persons it's it's definitely helpful and can be useful and i would say necessary i think that that i can look at points in my life where if advocate if i hadn't had advocates i would have had failure in what in what in my life Failure for my whole life, who knows? There's multi-universes. And I could, <laughs> you know, what would happen in this universe, I have no idea. But I know my life would have been different because I would have failed at something and had to make a different choice. And I had advocates all along the way that helped me. And I also, and this is, I want to raise this because this is something that came to mind. And I really want to point out the stress of being a leader. And I, if you are a person of color in a white institution, you are a leader. I don't care what your role is, what level, you know, you may write, you may choose, you may choose to write, you may choose you may, you may not be able to rise into the traditional leadership roles, but I don't think you can be a person of color in a, in a, a historically white institution without being a, a leader because of all the stuff you have to deal with. We're out of time for today. And so okay. we'll, we'll put a semicolon there, not a period. Hey, okay. welcome back to this. Professor Vernil Urana, Tina Patterson. There's a phrase that was used the other day by a friend, David Hoffman, that might apply. Let's just call today's effort episode truer than truth. Thank you both. Thank you all. Think Tech Hawaii and Aloha.